Good morning, and welcome to Ford Field as we anticipate the start of the 2015 season. And this marks the 69th season of football in the Mid-American Conference. That first season concluded with a Miami win over Texas Tech in the Sun Bowl on New Year's Day of 1948. We will gather again in Detroit on December 4th for the 19th Marathon Mid-American Conference Football Championship game. I want to acknowledge a few of our special guests in attendance with us today. Michael Kelly, the Chief Operating Officer of the College Football Playoff. Representatives from our bowl games, Jerry Silverstein with the Go Daddy Bowl, Doug Mosley with the Boca Raton Bowl, Johnny Williams with the Raycom Media Camellia Bowl, Danielle Brazil with the famous Idaho Potato Bowl, Ali Rogers with the Fiesta Bowl, Tosi Dezaki, the Capital One Orange Bowl, Bruce Binkowski with the San Diego County Credit Union Poinsettia Bowl, and Pete Durzis, who's the Senior Vice President with ESPN, representing the Popeyes Bahamas Bowl and the entire family of ESPN Bowl games. From our TV partners, Kurt Dargis, the Director of Programming and Acquisitions for College Football for ESPN, Dan Weinberg, the Senior Vice President with CBS and CBS Sports Network, in Best Barnes, Vice President with CBS Sports and the CBS Sports Network. Want to welcome two new head football coaches into our league, Lance Leopold, the University of Buffalo, and John Bonamago at Central Michigan University, and I think we all join together in wishing John the very best as he battles cancer. We welcome two new athletic directors, Nathan Mortimer, the Interim Director of Athletics at the University of Akron, and Mark Sandy, Director of Athletics at Ball State University. I would also like to recognize Bill Carollo, who serves as our coordinator of football officiating. A couple of officiating items for your information. First, the Mid-American Conference will be moving to eight officials this season. This move is being made upon the recommendation of our coordinator, and I commend our member institutions for making this investment. For several years now, I have discussed with Bill the possibility of having female officials work in our consortium. This year we have added several female officials to our roster and they will work games this season. Not because they are female, but because they have worked their way up through the officiating ranks and have mastered the rules and mechanics and are prepared for this next steps in their officiating career. The officials who come through our program receive greater training and evaluation opportunities than most. And I would encourage you to talk with Bill about the time and effort that goes into being a football official during the season and during the off season. And for those of you who wish, wish to look a little deeper, we will work to facilitate your efforts. Finally, let me give a big thank you to our coaches and students who staffed yesterday's fifth annual Mid-American Conference Youth Football Clinic here at Ford Field. In collaboration with the Detroit Police Athletic League, we had more than 525 youth learning about football and life from our coaches and student athletes on the turf of Ford Field, I might ask. A special thank you to the Detroit Lions for making the facility available for the clinic. While today is about looking towards the future, namely the upcoming season and all that it may hold, let me first highlight a few things from the previous year. 17 Mid-American Conference teams earned multi-year APRs putting them in the top 10% of all squads in their respective sports. In terms of single year APR rates, the Mid-American Conference was 11th out of 32 conferences and fourth among FBS conferences. I might also point out that the Mid-American Conference had the highest APR of all conferences in men's basketball and was fourth among all FBS conferences in football. The academic achievements of the students who participate in intercollegiate athletics in this conference are impressive. For instance, last spring, every single team at the University of Toledo had a GPA of 3.0 or better. 10 academic All-Americans, inc including Akron men's soccer student Andy Bevins, who was that sport's academic All-American of the year. Two students earned NCAA postgraduate scholarships NIU men's soccer student Dustin Page and Eastern Michigan women's volleyball student Rachel Iquinell. I should also add 
that Dustin Page has been a member of NIU's, who has been a member of NIU's and the conference's Student Athlete Advisory Committee, is a member of the NCAA's National SAC and will serve as the chair of that body this year, and he will also serve on the NCAA Council. Two weeks ago, the Women's Basketball Coaches Association announced its top 25 academic honor roll for last year. The Mid-American Conference led the way with three teams on that honor roll, Bowling Green, Toledo, and NIU. Only one other FBS conference had a single team on that list. Finally, last spring, and most importantly, more than 700 Mid-American Conference students who participated in intercollegiate athletics graduated. If you have watched a football game in the Mid-American Conference, you know that we produce some of the most exciting football in the country. In fact, I could say that about a number of our sports. And while some may view us as a modest or humble Midwest Conference, we produce a disproportionate amount of greatness. Our institutions bring an anytime, anywhere mentality. Our students who participate in athletics and our coaches go on to achieve remarkable achievements on the field and off. We make our own way, and in fact, as many of you know, during the month of November, we have our own game days. We have academic All-Americans, athletic All-Americans, students who are leaders in community service and social awareness, first round draft picks and national champions. With our growing expo exposure platforms anchored by ESPN and a new relationship with the CBS Sports Network and other sub-licensees, our institutions and sports teams will have exposure like never before. As a result, it's time to tell our story. About a year ago, we partnered with the branding agency 160 over 90 to assist in crafting our message. This firm has clients ranging from Nike, Ferrari, Under Armour, UCLA, and the Philadelphia Eagles, to name just a few. The Mid-American Conference represents hard work, dedication, humility, and passion highlighted by a passion for a challenge. I just love a quote by former NFL coaching great Marv Levy because I think it captures our attitude. And it's, quote, when it's too hard for them, it's just right for us. Beginning today and throughout the year, we will be rolling out a messaging effort designed to highlight who we are and what we value. With all of our efforts supported by a new microsite, GetSomeAction.com. Our aim is to define and illuminate the elements of action that include excitement on the playing field, achievement in the classroom, and engagement in the community. Let's roll a short video for you. Because we are modest, they think we can't be up to get. Because we're known for our manners, they think we can't raise free. Because we're not fueled by the spotlight, they think we won't steal it. Because we work out on a frozen tundra, they think we won't win the heat. You know what we say? Nothing at all. Here, on our turf, on our field, we keep our heads down and our eyes up. And no matter what we face, we answer with sweat. Because Max speaks louder than words. You know, it's fascinating, it's frustrating, and intriguing all at the same time to witness the considerable churn in and around intercollegiate athletics today. And there is no indication that this state of dubiosity will change anytime soon. First, it was a period in which there was significant change among conference memberships. Next, it was another change in the NCAA governance system and the many questions surrounding what that would entail. And now, it is judicial review and rulings that will play a significant role in how intercollegiate athletics operates in the future. It brings to mind the lyrics of those great philosophers of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, the Grateful Dead, when they sang, lately it occurs to me, what a long, strange trip it's been. Perhaps no other question is more prevalent than the issue of whether or not students who participate in athletics are in fact students first and foremost, or are they employees, where the opportunity to obtain an education is simply a fringe benefit. 
I believe, and the member institutions of the Mid-American Conference believe, that it is the former, and as a result, is what we should be focused on. Last year, the Big Ten issued a white paper that raised the issue of freshman ineligibility in football and men's basketball as a means to put more emphasis in a student-first, student-athlete model. This generated a great deal of conversation, and rightly so, for that was the purpose of this paper. Coincidentally, this very topic happened to be the subject of my research in completing my doctoral degree. Let's be very clear, there is no empirical evidence that participating in intercollegiate athletics as a freshman has a negative effect on the academic achievement of students who participate in athletics. My research and the research of others has found there is no relationship between playing as a freshman and academic achievement as measured by grade point average and graduation. The issue is not playing, it's preparation, academic preparation. Are we recruiting and admitting students prepared to do the classwork at the institution they attend? Based on the academic accolades I referenced earlier, I would suggest Mid-American Conference teams are doing a pretty good job of that. Initial eligibility rules came about in 1984 as the member institutions of the NCAA passed Proposition 48, also known as Bylaw 51J. This rule mandated that for an incoming student athlete to be eligible to practice, compete, and receive financial aid, the incoming freshman needed to have an accumulative minimum high school GPA of 2.0 in 11 core courses, as well as a 700 on the SAT or 15 on the ACT. This was the beginning of the NCAA's initial eligibility standards that have continued to evolve as we have increased the high school core course requirements, GPA requirements, and implemented a sliding scale for test scores. Additionally, continuing eligibility requirements have been layered on top. The concept of holding schools and teams accountable for the educational outputs of its students via the APR is a fairly heavy and effective hammer. We can and we will continue to argue about any of these pieces. However, the net result has been greater academic attainment and achievement by the students with higher retention rates and greater degree completion. The rules governing time restrictions on athletics activities are well-intentioned, yet contain a myriad of loopholes and exceptions. Students participating in an intercollegiate athletics are putting in a lot of time on their sport, and they want to. Sometimes it's through mandatory activities, sometimes it's voluntary activities, and sometimes it's somewhere in between. In any case, it all adds up. We are at a point where we need to throw out the existing rules and start over. Whether this means developing sport-specific rules or something broader is probably the initial discussion point. I do not believe the public will accept no oversight in this area. We need to come up with reasonable and explainable regulations that provide a balance between the academic and athletic demands of the students. Additionally, we should look not only at in-season activity, but also out-of-season activity. And this leads me to the issue of transfers. This is another area where we need to step back, take a deep breath, and give this matter a fresh look. I am a firm believer that there should be a one-year res of residency if one transfers, particularly in headcount sports such as football and basketball. And I also believe that if a student wants to transfer, he or she should not be required to seek permission or a waiver from their current institution so they would be eligible to compete or receive financial aid elsewhere. An issue that has also bubbled up in the past several years contain, concerns the issue of so-called graduate transfers. Students who have graduated yet have remaining eligibility and seek to transfer so they can ostensibly enter a graduate program not offered at their prior institution. This well-intentioned waiver is being exploited in ways never contemplated when this legislation was approved. However, I think it would now be difficult to impose a one-year residency requirement for graduate transfers, but I do believe there are things that should be done to give greater oversight of this area. First, graduate transfers should be accounted for within an institution's APR, and the institution should be held accountable for the continuing retention and eligibility of a graduate transfer. Additionally, the institution taking the graduate transfer should be required to commit financial aid for two years, whether the student 
remains on the team that long or not. If the transfer is in fact for academic reasons, the institution should be required to commit the resources for two years, which is the typical length of time for attaining a graduate degree. All of these issues, initial, initial and continuing eligibility, retention and graduation, transfers, time demands, these are all interrelated. And the time has come for us as a conference and us as an association to take a comprehensive look at the current collegiate experience and consider a new paradigm. For instance, in certain sports, especially in football and basketball, it takes more than four years to graduate, and that includes attending summer school. Perhaps we should consider a new model that reduces the minimum academic load during the regular academic year, especially in light of the concerns over balancing academic and athletic time demands. Students could then pick up additional hours in the summer, during an additional summer term, the student should also have an opportunity to do something else besides school or sports, be it an internship, a job, or simply have some free time for themselves. And as part of this, I would take a long look at moving towards five years of eligibility with no waivers except for injury. Is this a perfect solution? Probably not. There isn't one. But the time has come to develop a new paradigm one that is not constrained by past models or regulations, and one that is based on the 21st century student who participates in intercollegiate athletics. Former business and automotive great Lee Iacocca, when faced with challenges and an uncertain future, said, quote, so what do we do? Anything, something, so long as we just don't sit there. If we screw it up, start over. Try something else. If we wait until we've satisfied all uncertainties, it may be too late. Coming out of our spring meetings, I appointed a working group that includes administrators, faculty, and students participating in intercollegiate athletics to ponder this matter. I expect our working group to develop concepts for review by the various governance groups in our conference, and ultimately our conference passing along concepts for consideration by the NCAA. An area of pride among our membership is in the area of student-athlete well-being. Among the issues that we have been focused on is on mental health. There has been great attention paid to the health of students participating in athletics, most prominently of late on the subject of concussion prevention and management. However, there's been scant attention paid to the issues of mental health. Let me share just a few statistics for you. One in four young adults between the ages of 18 and 24 are dealing with some form of mental illness. One third of students entering college are coming in with a prior diagnosed mental health condition. 82% of certified athletics trainers believe anxiety disorders are an issue with students who participate in athletics on their campus. Two years ago, at the urging of our faculty athletics representatives and student athlete advisory committee, I appointed a mental health task force that spent more than 18 months exploring this issue researching and reviewing the mental health concerns of our students and examining the support services available. This past spring, the task force brought forth a series of recommendations that were endorsed by the Mid-American Conference Joint Council. Included in this were a series of best practices and minimum standards for addressing the mental health needs of our students participating in athletics that will be implemented by our institutions. There is a strong focus on education and awareness for students, coaches, and administrators. For we need to better understand the mental health issues we are dealing with. And we must and we will remove the stigma associated with this topic, as well as provide safe havens for students to seek and receive appropriate treatment. We need to emphasize to all that it is okay not to be okay. Later this academic year, the Student Athlete Advisory Committees at each Mid-American Conference institution will hold their second annual Mental Health Awareness Week. During the inaugural event last spring, Central Michigan Uni University SAC was highlighted on BuzzFeeds for its awareness initiative. Additionally, upon the recommendation of our task force, the conference is creating a student athlete well-being committee to focus on the physical, mental, and social well-being of our students. And our conference student athlete advisory committee is creating a mental health committee. And I am pleased to announce that on February 16th 
of 2016, we will collaborate with the NCAA to host the Mid-American Conference and NCAA Sports Sciences Institute Mental Health Summit to be held in Cleveland. This first-of-a-kind event will focus on the very important topic of mental health of our student-athletes. The Mid-American Conference is committed to the physical and mental well-being of its students who participate in intercollegiate athletics and will continue to work to better the students' experiences in every way. Another area in which the conference is focused is in the area in diversity and hiring. If one reviews the national statistics for the past decade, it is evident that the number of ethnic minorities hired for head coaching positions in football and basketball and administrative leaderships has remained proportionally low and relatively flat. The number of women being hired into head coaching positions is decreasing. The time has come for not only our conference, but for this association to do more than simply acknowledge these numbers. The time has come to study and find out why this is occurring and take steps to alter these trends. Earlier this summer, I appointed a task force to consider this issue. I do not know what the conclusions of the task force will be, but I do know that we will work hard to examine this issue and seek answers to improving the diversity of our coaches and administrators. This is an area where we believe we need to take action and lead a national effort. We can do more. There is a lot on our plate, but in so many ways, it is an incredibly exciting time to be involved in intercollegiate athletics and higher education. The English novelist Margaret Drabble said, quote, when nothing is sure, everything is possible. Our membership is seeking to use this dynamic time as an opportunity to make positive change for the betterment of our institutions and more importantly, for the betterment of our students. Former Miami University Director of Athletics, Dick Schreider, has a wonderful quote that truly captures what we are about. And he said, quote, four years in college are very important, but the next 40 are the ones we are more concerned with. Our coaches, our faculty, our administrators are about preparing young men and women for the rest of their lives, through the classroom, on the playing field, in the dorm, and in the locker room. It's what we do, and it's who we are. And now it's time to go play some football. The expectations of our membership and this conference have not changed. We expect to win non-conference games. We expect to win bowl games. And we expect to challenge for the college football host bowl slot. I'll be glad to entertain some questions. If you could raise your hands for questions for Commissioner Steinbrecher, and we'll pass the microphone around. Please state your name and affiliation. Tom McElgin with the Hustle Belt. Uh, the MAC has been present in Detroit before it was hip and cool to be. And uh, you mentioned that you have a new branding agency. What's been done to increase the profile of the MAC in uh, the city of Detroit and to uh, uh, gain access some, to some of the new and interesting opportunities that are taking place in the city? You know, that's an ongoing effort, and it's something we need to continue to work on because you're right, there's so many wonderful things happening in this city. Uh, we have a tremendous partnership with the Detroit Lions, and it starts first and foremost there. But we need to continue in building our efforts out through the, the Sports Council here and the other public agencies. But one of the things that we starting at a grassroot level, and that's one of the reasons we started uh, the youth clinic we do. We, ex we want to be good corporate citizens here, and we want the, the, the citizens and the community to embrace us. So it's a two-way street. And so that's one way we're trying to get at that. And we need to continue. It's, it's, it's an effort that will never stop. Uh, um, Sports-specific rules. Um, can you express that a little bit more? Or well, I believe I was talking in the area of time demands with regard to sports specific rules. Okay, I, I, I was going, I was headed towards transfers in terms of, uh, you mentioned the transfer rules. It seems like the current rule really fits football to a T uh, and the football coaches seem to be able to maneuver it pretty well. But the basketball, which is probably gets the most focus is the, one that- The graduate transfer? Yes. Um, I'd say it's there's good and bad to it is, is how I would look look at it. Um, 
you know what, if, if, a, if a young person can go on and, and further their education, good for that person and the opportunities that are provided with it. Uh, there needs to be greater regulation of it. Right now, there is absolutely no academic oversight of that. I and guess so what, that's where we need to, to focus in on. I guess what I'm, I'm pointing to is that it seems to be the transfer, the heavy uh, tilt of transfers in football is from BCS or excuse me, the Power Five conferences down, mm -hmm. where the heavy burden or levy of tilt of transfers in basketball seems to be uh, mm -hmm. mid-major and up. I don't know if the numbers are actually that clean, um, but it's occurring up and down the entire spectrum. I, I, I think there's a number of coaches, probably the basketball coaches think it's more disconcerting just from a numbers. They lose one person and it can disrupt the whole roster. Not quite as, as dramatic probably on the football side of it. Jason Arkley, the Athens Messenger. Uh, could you update us on the, the, the state of the conference as a whole when it comes to total cost of attendance? Yeah. Presidents voted it in December, NCAA passed it in January. How many schools are, are ready to, to implement that? Well, I'll let you fall. visit with, with all of the, the individual schools. Our schools are committed to doing that. Some are phasing it in. Um, but the most, most of them are proceeding uh, right now with it. And again, there are a couple that are phasing it in over a couple years. I believe that's correct. Luke Petrovich, Toledo Blade. Uh, since the since the conference switched to weeknight games, uh, how has that positively or negatively affected it? Good question, uh, because we've been doing well over a decade of, of the November weeknight games. It's certainly been a boon in making this a national conference uh, in football. Um, I don't think anybody can argue that. Our coaches speak to the fact that they can recruit nationally and go in any door and people have good recognition of it. Um, I also think there's no doubt that it creates some hardships for our fans. Uh, it's, it's more difficult to get out on a weeknight. We, we understand that, we acknowledge it. And so we're asking that our fans for one or two home games a year work with us on that. Uh, it, there's some give and take there. Um, but I think by and large, it's been very, very positive for this conference. Right, Mark on Buffalo News. On the transfer question, you mentioned it's hard to require senior transfers to do the one-year residency requirement. Why is that? Is that, uh, uh, I mean, wh why is it? Is it too much of a hardship for, for the schools? For, for the graduate transfers? Right. I, I don't know that the general public would accept at this point slapping on a, a one-year residency requirement. Why is it too hard for the, too much of a, uh, too much for the school to commit two years to a player who's only gonna be on the- No, I think, I think they should commit two years. I'm, I'm fully in agreement with that. Um, I don't think they would, people would accept, the general public would accept saying, you have to, if, after you've already played three years and you've graduated, you've now got to sit out a year. Right. That, that, that I think would be challenging. And then the other thing, you talked about loopholes to time restrictions uh, in the rules. Can you give a couple examples of well, where, uh, in terms of student athletes, time restrictions, but there's loopholes well, it, to that. It more has to do with classification. You know, you're blocked in, uh, an athletic event gets assigned a certain number, whether it is or not. Travel doesn't factor into those types of things. We need to just be more realistic in laying out what, what the time demands are and acknowledge them and be much more transparent with them than we are. Uh, doesn't mean they're not, that they necessarily lessen, but let's, let's quit with the artificial, uh, uh, um, we artificially say this event is two hours when it went three and a half or four, and plus I had to travel nine hours. Commissioner? Alan Jordan from the sport, Pitt Sports and Entertainment. With the new health issue initiative that you're launching, does it have anything to do with the recent concussion issues on a professional level? No, it's, it's really separate of that. And we've been, uh, the mental health stuff was something entirely different from that. The concussion part of it, we really addressed and continue to address. We were one of the first three conferences that put in place a protocol on concussion management. Um, I don't know, was that three or four years ago now, in fact, on that. The mental health stuff really came up through the ranks with our faculty reps and our students. And they said, this is an area where there's not enough attention being being given to us. And so we 
simply try to, to dive into that, and we've kind of run with it since then. We're going to take one last question from John Wagner, and then we're going to continue with our program. I will remind everyone that we will have Commissioner Steinbrecher and the other representatives all in this room for one-on-ones at the conclusion of this. So we'll go ahead and take one last question, and then we'll wrap up, and then we're going to ask all of our head coaches to come to the center with John for a group photo. Go ahead, John. John Wagner, Toledo Blade, no pressure on me, obviously. Uh, going back to the transfer question, if I asked you to put a word on it, would you call it a problem, a concern, and, and would your answer change as you looked at football as opposed to basketball? And I assume you're talking about the graduate transfer. Yes, sir. A concern. It's, it's, um, it's, it's not, what's occurring is not what was intended. Um, we want to have the best interests of the students in mind. We want to have the best interests of the institution in mind, and we have to blend those two. Uh, and so we need to have accountability on both sides of it. But when you in basketball literally have schools that are putting together recruiting books, uh, trying to identify uh, kids who will be in that situation, and then they're out recruiting those kids. That wasn't the purpose of this. And if we're doing that, something's wrong. And so let's, let's go back to the drawing board and let's figure it out a little better. No, I, I don't think so. I, I think, to me, the biggest issue is one of the lack of account of academic accountability, quite frankly. If kids are going to go there, that's great, but then let's do what we say we're going to do.